going to give everybody another minute or so to join before we um, officially get started. So please just um, uh, stay tuned. Thank you. All right, I think we can get started now. So uh, again, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and, and welcome to our ICAP Grand Rounds. I am um, really very excited about uh, today's program, um, where we are going to be hearing um, two very interesting and different presentations on sexually transmitted infections. Um, they will be um, explaining the importance um, of sexually transmitted infections, which certainly many of you are aware of, but in fact, the rates are rising. Uh, this, this is a topic that's in the news um, all the time, even, even today. Um, we're going to hear um, first in our first talk, um, Okay, maybe before I do the introductions of our speakers, I'll um, just um, remind everybody to use the Q&A box for your questions. You can enter your questions at any time into the Q&A box um, as we go along, but we're going to have our Q&A session for both of our speakers at the very end. Um, so uh, that's what we're... Um, going to do how that's how we're going to handle the Q&A. So let's go to the next slide so I can introduce our speakers. Um, our first talk um, is going to be given by Dr. Jason Zucker. Um, uh, Dr. Zucker is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases here um, at Columbia. Um, and he's the assistant medical director of the New York City STD Prevention Training Center. And his research focuses on the intersection of data science, behavioral science, and implementation science. Um, and he's particularly interested in thinking about how to optimize engagement in the sexual health cascade of care. Um, Jason uh, trained as a combined adult and pediatric infectious disease physician um, and is an experienced HIV treatment, HIV prevention, and sexual health care provider. Um, he's going to give us a broad overview on uh, STI prevention and also talk to us about a form of post-exposure prophylaxis um, with doxycycline. In our second talk, we're going to hear from Dr. Harriet Nuagaba Biribonwoha, um, who certainly many of you from ICAP are familiar with. Harriet is... Um, a medical doctor and assistant professor of epidemiology here at Columbia. And she's the research director um, of our ICAP in Eswatini office, where she oversees a diverse portfolio of clinical research, program evaluation, implementation science, surveys, and surveillance activities. Um, she's also the clinical research site leader for the Eswatini Prevention Center, which is a clinical research site that's part of um, uh, the NIH's uh, HIV Prevention Trials Network. Um, so uh, Harriet is going to talk to us about a recent clinical trial that she led in Eswatini on sexually transmitted infections using point-of-care testing as diagnostics. So let's begin with um, uh, Jason, who is going to put his own slide deck up. So we just need a moment as we're switching slide decks. Okay, Jason. J Jason, you're on mute. Jason, you're on mute. Please. Sorry about that. Oh, wait. Okay. All right. So good morning again, and thank you so much for the invitation to talk today and the introduction. I'm really excited to talk about what's become a really hot topic of late, ending the STI epidemic through prevention. 
I have no commercial relationships to disclose, but I do receive NIH and CDC research funding, and I'll be a medical consultant for the CDC for an upcoming version of the STI guidelines. So I always start like to start by reminding everyone about the epidemic of STIs or sexually transmitted infections. This is US data that was just released going back to 2022. And while chlamydia cases decreased by 6% in the prior five years, cases of gonorrhea increased by 11%, cases of syphilis increased by 80%, and congenital syphilis increased by a staggering 183%. In addition to being common and prevalent, STIs are expensive. In the US, they cost over 16 billion per year, including 1.1 billion in direct costs for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis alone, the three most common but easily tested for and treatable bacterial STIs. And this is just not a United States problem. It's a global problem as well. Global estimates of the four curable STIs, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and trichomoniasis, are 374 million incident cases per year. This means that almost 1 million STIs are acquired every day with approximately 129 million chlamydia infections, 82 million gonorrhea infections, and over 7 million syphilis infections occurring each year. Recent reports from around the world have echoed this increase in bacterial STIs that we're seeing. And STIs are not always benign. We need to prevent STIs because they cause harm. On the left is the standard slide that the CDC uses when they talk about STIs contributing to giving or getting HIV the complications of long-term pelvic and abdominal pain, as well as increased likelihood of pregnancy complications or the inability to get pregnant. But there are more complications than just that. Untreated STIs can lead to urethral strictures, gastrointestinal fistulas, perirectal abscesses, and the severe complications of syphilis, including permanent vision or hearing impairment, as well as devastating consequences of congenital syphilis. And so as we discuss the cost and, cost and methods needed for preventing STIs, it's important to keep in mind the potential benefits. And it's not just individual level consequences. We need to think about population and global ones as well. Antimicrobial resistance is one of the top global public health and development threats, and gonorrhea has been on the list of urgent resistant threats for years. With resistant cases of gonorrhea in England being described as scary headlines like super resistant gonorrhea, and for those of us in the US, this has become a more salient issue as we had our first two cases of multi-drug non-susceptible gonorrhea in the US just a year ago. So this is my version of the STI prevention landscape. And I break it up into primary and secondary prevention. Primary prevention is focused on avoiding disease entirely with interventions done before a disease ever occurs. And this includes evidence-based interventions like condoms, risk reduction counseling, vaccination, and medication prophylaxis. Secondary prevention involves screening to offer early detection and diagnosis, syndromic testing and treatment, presumptive treatment, and partner services, including expedited partner therapy or treating partners without a formal evaluation. I always like to have a case to set the stage. And this case is based on a real patient who's come through our sexual health program recently. This is Igor, a 29-year-old male living in New York City, who's in our program taking HIV prep for HIV prevention. He's sexually active with men and had four condomless partners since his last visit. He walks into clinic between his regular quarterly appointments with two days of green penile discharge. We did our routine workup, which includes testing for HIV, syphilis, and three-site gonorrhea and chlamydia testing. And we treated him empirically with IM ceftriaxone and oral doxycycline as per the 2021 update to the CDC guidelines. This is Igor's STI prevention plan. And this is true for many patients. It includes elements of both primary and secondary prevention. For primary prevention, he receives risk reduction counseling from our sexual health navigators at his regular visits. For vaccination, he's been vaccinated against HPV, hepatitis A and B, meningococcal disease with the men ACYW vaccine, and MPOX. He also takes daily HIV prep to prevent HIV. For secondary prevention, he engages in routine screening every three months as part of our program. He knows to come in for syndromic testing and treatment if he has symptoms, as he did today. And he knows if he's exposed to give our navigators a call to come in for treatment. 
However, in the past, he's not been willing to refer his partners for treatment or provide expedited partner therapy, although it is offered to him. His labs come back the next day, non-reactive for HIV and non-reactive for syphilis, but positive for gonorrhea in his urine, pharynx, and rectum. So Igor is diagnosed with gonorrhea, but you may remember he was treated empirically with ceftriaxone and doxycycline. So we call him and tell him that he has completed treatment, but to avoid sexual contact for the next seven days. We also let him know that based on the United States CDC guidelines, he should consider a test of cure for his pharyngeal gonorrhea in two weeks. He doesn't come back in two weeks. However, he returns six weeks later saying, I got totally better, but now it hurts again when I pee. He's had seven condomless partners since that last visit, and he's confident that his regular partners were treated for both gonorrhea, they were treated for gonorrhea. He's back in clinic with recurrent dysuria and a small amount of discharge. So we again do our routine testing and again treat him empirically with ceftriaxone and doxycycline per the guidelines. But this time he's really honest. He says, this is frustrating. Is there anything I can do to stop getting STIs? And what he's really asking for is a method of primary prevention to prevent, prevent STIs. In this case, medication prophylaxis with doxypep, which now joins HIV post-exposure prophylaxis and HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis in our STI medication arsenal. So let's talk about doxypep and make sure we're all on the same page. Operationally, doxypep is doxycycline, 200 milligrams by mouth, ideally within 24 hours, but up to 72 hours after a condomless sexual encounter at any anatomic site. So there are three things we need to carefully consider when it comes to doxypep. The benefits, the risks, and if we decide to move forward, how to best implement this intervention to balance the benefits and risks, as well as ensure equity in implementation. So the question of benefits starts with a pretty simple question. Does doxypep work to prevent STIs? And to answer this, we can look at the available data. This is the summary of what's known about doxypep. We now have four completed randomized contri control trials. I wanna highlight first that all four randomized control trials were post-exposure prophylaxis. While pre-exposure prophylaxis trials are ongoing and there is one older small trial, there is not enough data to recommend doxyprep yet. And so everything we'll talk about today is doxy post-exposure prophylaxis. Second, the first three trials only included men who have sex with men and transgender women taking HIV PrEP. And the doxypep trial included men who have sex with men and transgender women living with HIV. Only this last study, the DPEP study completed in Kenya, included cisgender females. When it comes to effectiveness and the risk reduction, you can see that the IPERGAY study, which was completed in 2018, showed a 47% relative risk reduction in STIs. The DOXYPEP study showed a 66% reduction in those taking PrEP and a 62% reduction in those living with HIV. And the DOXYVAC study showed a 66% reduction, uh, relative risk reduction. Disappointingly, the DOXYPEP study showed no reduction in STI incidence. Based on some studies of hair done after the study was completed, there is suspicion it may have been uh, due to people not taking the drug adequately. However, at this point in time, there really is no recommendation for uh, doxycycline prophylaxis in females because the one study we have did not show a benefit. And if you're interested, uh, Dr. Marazzo from NIAID wrote a really great editor uh, viewpoint in the New England Journal this past month. So to summarize what we've learned and what we know, Doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis is safe and well-tolerated. It prevents STIs in men who have sex with men and transgender women, both taking HIV PrEP and living with HIV. And Doxypep did not prevent STIs in cisgender women in the DPEP study completed in Kenya. So we know about the benefits and we know that Doxypep can reduce STIs in the right population. But what are the risks? How will Doxypep impact sexual behavior? How will doxypep change the presentation or diagnosis of STIs? How will doxypep impact antimicrobial resistance? And how will doxypep change overall antibiotic and doxycycline usage? The first issue is the issue of how doxypep will impact sexual behavior, which really relates to the idea of risk compensation. 
I want to be clear that we're not concerned about people having more sex. We aim to be sex positive and we want people to be comfortable enough to have the type and amount of sex that is right for them. However, one way DoxyPep differs from HIV PrEP is that HIV PrEP is nearly 100% effective, while DoxyPep is less so, particularly for gonorrhea. So there is the potential for risk compensation to ultimately result in more STIs, negating the benefits of DoxyPep. However, with that said, that's not what we saw in the two clinical trials. In both the DoxyPep and DoxyVac studies, DoxyPep did not appreciably change sexual behavior. The next potential issue is the worry about antibiotic prophylaxis changing the presentation or diagnosis of STIs. And so far, there's no data that this is true, but it's certainly an area of concern, particularly around syphilis testing where we use serology. And we've seen with HIV testing in early starts that early treatment can change serological testing results, resulting in delayed antibody formation or even antibody reversal. And so there are concerns that, especially with syphilis, where we don't have great diagnostic options, that doxypep could result in partial treatment, delayed diagnosis, or false negative or test results. And I think those two concerns are relatively minor compared to this major global concern about antimicrobial resistance. Antibiotic resistance is a global problem. The WHO has provided guidance on how to reduce antimicrobial resistance, including things like only prescribe and dispense antibiotics when they are truly needed. They also have global surveillance programs to monitor resistance, including in pathogens like gonorrhea. And when we think about antimicrobial resistance, we're actually thinking about both resistance in STIs like syphilis, chlamydia, mycoplasma genitalium, and gonorrhea, as well as resistance in commensal bacteria, the bacteria that lives on all of our skin and in our gut. So I'd like to start off easy with chlamydia and syphilis, where we believe the risk of resistance is relatively low. For chlamydia, no clinical resistance to tetracyclines in chlamydia trachomatis has been seen, and we've been using doxy for years. However, there is some mild concern because tetracycline resistance has been seen in chlamydia suis, which is in pigs. For syphilis, there have been no clinical resistance to tetracycline seen. And this is important right now because we're using more and more doxycycline for syphilis in the United States due to an ongoing benzazine penicillin shortage. The concern about resistance in syphilis mainly stems not from doxy, but from the widespread macrolide or azithromycin resistance that was seen after a single point mutation in syphilis. That mutation became so widespread that the CDC now recommends against macrolides for syphilis. Next up gets a little more complicated, and that's mycoplasma genitalium, which is probably the number one STI I get consulted for these days, rapidly overtaking syphilis. Because mycoplasma genitalium may be new, this is my sort of everything you need to know about MGen in one slide slide. MGen is really interesting because in the 2015 CDC STI guidelines, it was an emerging pathogen, but by 2021, it was here with its own section. We generally think about MGen when patients have persistent genitourinary symptoms or persistent urethritis, and that's because it's commonly found if you were to look um, at people with urethritis, over a quarter of them would actually test positive for MGen. We can test for it using nucleic acid amplification testing, the same way we do for gonorrhea or chlamydia. And treatment is tricky, requiring sequential resistance-guided therapy with the two options you see below. However, most places don't have sensitivity testing available, and so primarily use the top option of seven days of doxycycline, followed by seven days of moxifloxacin, a 14-day course. MGen is challenging to treat because it's intrinsically resistant to cell wall agents like beta-lactams, like cephalosporins, and folic acid inhibitors like trimethoprin sulfamethoxazole, while concurrently having high rates of resistance to protein synthesis inhibitors like macrolides or azithromycin, tetracyclines like doxycycline, and quinolones like moxifloxacin or levofloxacin. The regimen that we chose, the sequential treatment, is actually based on the study conducted in Australia that showed the benefits of doxy followed by moxy or azithro. They showed a greater than 90% efficacy for sequential therapy. And the theory is really based on what you see on the right here. It's the idea that doxycycline reduces the bacterial load, which allows the second agent to clear the infection. However, what's unclear is what are the effects of increasing doxy resistance? If it no longer lowers the bacterial load or no longer lowers it as much, 
will we still be able to clear the infection as easily? Finally, the biggest beast of our concerns, gonorrhea. And the concerns around gonorrhea are both around tetracycline resistance, not because we use it to treat gonorrhea, but the concern that if resistance increases, that doxypep will be less effective against gonorrhea. Furthermore, and more concerning, there's also the possibility of generating cross-resistance to other antibiotics like ceftriaxone. This was a modeling study done by Mortimer and Grad, and it's a bit complicated to review in the short period of time we have. But essentially, they looked at the two mechanisms of resistance that, tetracy that tetracyclines and gonorrhea have, plasmid-mediated resistance and chromosomally encoded mutation resistance. They looked at sensitivity results from an international cohort, as well as a US cohort, and found that co-resistance or resistance to tetracycline as well as other classes of antibiotics was more common in the uh, sorry, chromosomally encoded mutations. The key point here is that it's really necessary to know what type of mutations we're selecting for with doxypep, as there is the potential risk for development of cross-resistance to other antimicrobials as doxypep gets rolled out on a large scale. I didn't show it here today, but there is a second study that looked at 2,000 gonococcal isolates from Europe, which found a very similar finding. Again, chromosomally associated mutations were associated with cross-resistance to other antibiotics. So those are our STI resistance concerns, but we also have concerns about commensal organisms. This was a systematic review looking at the impact of tetracyclines on antimicrobial resistance of normal flora. Even doing this review, they only found seven articles fulfilling their inclusion criteria, most with a high risk of bias, highlighting how limited our data is in this area. What they found is that limited data from small prospective studies suggests that oral tetracyclines for two to 18 weeks do increase resistance in subgingival, gastrointestinal, and upper respiratory flora. But given the limited data, it's important that STI prophylaxis trials include antimicrobial resistance outcomes, and both of two of the trials we talked about earlier did. We'll start with the DOXY-PEP study, uh, gonorrhea on the left-hand side and Staph aureus on the right-hand side. For gonorrhea, cultures were available for 17% of gonorrhea infections because it is a hard organism to grow. Baseline tetracycline resistance was 27%. After enrollment, resistance was 38% in the doxycycline group and 12% in the standard of care group. Furthermore, doxypep appeared less protective for tetracycline resistant gonorrhea, although the sample size was small. On the right, we have Staph aureus. And at baseline, Staph aureus was cultured from 45% of participants with a 12% baseline doxycycline resistant rate. At 12 months, Staph aureus colonization was significantly less in the doxy PEP groups, but the prevalence of doxycycline resistance was 16% in the doxy groups and 8% in the standard of care groups. And so what you see is a reduction in colonization with an increased rate of resistance, a trade-off that we really need more data and time to better understand. Next, we have the doxy back study. Again, starting on the left with gonorrhea, cultures were available, ooh, sorry, cultures were available for 15% of isolates and baseline tetracycline resistance was 100%, although with no high level resistance. In follow-up, the prevalence of high level resistance was greater in the doxy PEP group than in the standard of care group. On the right-hand side, they looked at MRSA in the pharynx and ESBL E. coli in the rectum and they found no significant difference in the detection of ESBL E. coli or MRSA. The overall conclusions from these two slides are that the efficacy of doxypep for gonorrhea may differ depending on the prevalence of tetracycline resistance and may change over time if more resistance is generated. For Staph aureus, doxypep in the doxypep study was associated with decreased colonization, but increased rates of resistance. All trade-offs that we need more data to better understand. And this is critical because doxypep will increase doxycycline usage. To fully balance doxypep consumption would require restricting prescriptions to group with an incidence of seven to eight infections per person year, which is unlikely to happen. And so monitoring changes in antibiotic consumption and the burden of resistance are critical to understanding the effects of doxypep. So we know that doxypep works. We understand the risks. Next up is implementation. Implementation that focuses on maximizing the benefits while minimizing the risks and ensuring equity for the most vulnerable populations. 
This includes questions like who should be given doxypep? What is the proper interval for STI testing for individuals on doxypep? And how does this impact STI treatment? So we start with who should we be giving doxypep to? As we just discussed, there are both benefits and risks, as well as a lot of unknowns. And so we want to figure out the optimal population that reduces STIs while minimizing antibiotic usage. Dr. Michael Traeger, while working at Fenway in Boston, actually used their EHR to define 10 doxypep prescribing strategies and look at the proportion of individuals prescribed doxypep and proportion of diagnosis averted. He found that the most efficient prescribing strategies were based on STI history rather than HIV status or PrEP use. That work really made it into a lot of the recommendations you'll see around the world. When it comes to guidelines from different organizations, they differ widely in both language and recommendations. We'll start with the UK, where the British Association for Sexual Health and HIV, or BASH, recently released a statement saying that, importantly, it remains the case that doxy taken as PEP or PrEP is not endorsed by BASH or the UK Health Service. This is primarily because of current concerns regarding antimicrobial resistance and limited long-term data. With that said, while that's the statement, if you read the position statement they put out, they did put a lot of guidance in on how to do this safely and properly because they recognize that based on the data that exists, people will be taking this intervention. In Australia, the guidelines focus on doxypep primarily for the prevention of syphilis. It also recommends that they find strategies to maximize the benefits while minimizing overall antibiotic use. For example, if a doxypep user tends to have multiple sexual partners during weekends, but few during the week, a single Monday morning dose should adequately cover their STI risk rather than multiple doses over the weekend. In the United States, the CDC has preliminary guidance that's not yet finalized, but they recommend that doxypep be considered for gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, as well as transgender women, with a history of at least one bacterial STI in the prior 12 months, which is essentially the study population of the doxypep and doxyvac studies. Worldwide, WHO guidelines are pending. They uh, announced the development of the consolidated guidelines for 2022-2023, and they mentioned that one of the objectives of the next meeting was going to be to discuss the scope and PICO for developing doxypep guidelines. Other open questions are how doxypep should change our STI testing schedule, considering that it's only about two-thirds effective and that gonorrhea effectiveness could be reasonably expected to decrease as resistance rises. In general, most sites and most countries are not changing screening intervals and recommendations and continuing routine screening based on local guidance and availability, whether that's CDC guidance, WHO guidance, or other local guidance on the proper interval for STI testing. Finally, what about treatment? Well, so far there are no recommendations to adjust treatment based on doxypep. However, I would consider in-person exam, testing, and deferring empiric treatment for asymptomatic persons with an STI exposure who'd be taking, who've been taking doxypep appropriately. I wanna take a step back and return to Igor, who you may remember came back to clinic six weeks after treatment with painful urination. His labs again returned positive for urine and pharyngeal gonorrhea. And we actually did a culture because he came back so quickly, which returned positive for Cipro and tetracycline resistance. And this is actually high level resistance since the MIC is greater than eight. And so will doxycycline prophylaxis work for gonorrhea in this case? And I think there's definitely a suggestion that high level doxy resistance is associated with doxy pep failures. And we'll likely learn more as we acquire more data. When we told them that doxypep may not work for gonorrhea moving forward, Igor asked us if there's anything else we can offer him. And so I want to mention the doxyvac study one more time. While doxypep compared um, doxypep to, to placebo, the doxyvac study actually had four arms. Because in the hypergay study, they only found effectiveness against uh, chlamydia and syphilis and not against gonorrhea, the doxyvac study actually included arms and included the 4C men B vaccine or men B vaccination for possible protection against gonorrhea. And that's because they have very similar outer membrane proteins. Supporting that hypothesis, there's observational data, including studies in Italy, Australia, and the US, that suggest an efficacy of 40 to 47% for two doses of the 4C men B vaccination. So DoxyVac has not yet published their results, but they did 
um, present their interim data at CROI just about a year ago, which showed a 51% reduction in gonorrhea due to vaccination. Based on the results of their study, as well as the DOXY-PEP study, the DSMB initially recommended to stop the study and that all participants be offered doxycycline and or the MenB vaccine. However, it came out shortly thereafter that there was a discrepancy between the interim and final analysis on the effectiveness of MenB vaccine for gonococcal infections, and a reanalysis is ongoing. The PI of that study said at this stage, we cannot draw any conclusions regarding the effectiveness of MenB vaccine in preventing the risk of gonococcal infections. It's now necessary to wait for the results of an independent investigation before being able to discuss the potential effectiveness of this vaccine. Interestingly, in the interim, the British Health Service suggested that 4C men B be offered for the prevention of gonorrhea in those who are at greatest risk of infection. And hopefully we'll learn more about whether this intervention works when the DOXYVAC study is finally published. So I just wanna summarize what we talked about today. We're in the era of STI prevention and patients should be aware of their options. DOXYPEP works to prevent STIs in men who have sex with men and transgender women living with and without HIV. DOXYPEP did not work to prevent STIs in persons assigned female at birth in the Kenyan study. There remain unknowns about the overall benefits, risks, and implementation of DOXYPEP that potential users should be aware of, which really highlights the importance of shared decision-making with patients. 4 c men may reduce an individual's risk of gonorrhea. Uh, it prevented it in observational studies, but randomized clinical trial is not yet confirmatory. In this area, flexibility is gonna be key and management will change as we learn more. And research is needed to better help us understand the risks and benefits of different STI prevention modalities. And with that, I'll turn it over to Harriet to talk about an innovative POC point of care testing project. Thank you very much. Great, that was wonderful. Jason, thank you. So Harriet, please go ahead. Um, you can share your slides and we'll move right into the second talk. And I'm just going to encourage folks um, to go ahead and enter any questions you might have in the Q&A box. Um, and uh, great. Go ahead, um, Harriet. Harriet, if you are just making sure you're not muted, please go ahead. And if you can also put your presentation in presentation mode as well. Sure. Uh, I am not muted. Um, thank you. Do you see slides, but they are not in presentation mode, correct? correct. Yes, correct. So that's coming up now. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think I'll keep my video off just to make sure I have enough bandwidth um, for the presentation. Thank you, um, Jessica, for the kind introduction. Thank you to the Ground Rounds conveners for inviting me to participate in, in discussing this really important topic. Um, my next few minutes are going to be spent um, just giving you a sense of what this might look like um, in a developing country, trying to advance services for STI, testing, diagnosis, and treatment. And so on behalf of my co-authors, I will present um, a short, small pilot that we conducted um, on the feasibility and acceptability of point of care testing for two of the most common um, sexually transmitted infections. So just to start with a little bit of context, I'm hoping my slides have moved um, on your end. Uh, yes, I am, yes, I'm presenting from Eswatini. Eswatini is here, if you can see that dot right over there. Um, it's a small country with a population of around 1 million people. And it's a country that has a fairly severe, um, one of the severest HIV epidemics globally. The H key HIV indicators are shown in the table in the middle. In Eswatini, in some age groups, one in two adults are living with HIV. The incidence of HIV exceeds 1% among women. And that may sound like doom and gloom, but it's a country that has also made tremendous progress 
in terms of HIV programming and in fact has pretty much achieved the 95, 95, 95 UN indicators. So we have very aggressive, very scaled up HIV programs um, in primary health facilities that uh, um, clients attend. You can access HIV testing, reproductive health services, and diagnostic and treatment services as needed. However, we haven't seen the um, in tandem increase in programming for STIs. We do have a severe STI disease burden. Around one in five adults have been diagnosed in, um, with STIs in previous studies. But in routine service delivery settings, we still rely on syndromic management and there isn't any routine laboratory testing for diagnosis and treatment of STIs. And with everything that the previous speaker has said, talking about PEP and PrEP and vaccination services, um, it wouldn't be a great idea, even if there's need, to do this flying blind. So we worked with the Ministry of Health to see how we can move from reliance on signs and symptoms that are fairly unreliable. There's extensive literature on uh, folks not really reporting symptoms they have or symptoms not being detected or over-treatment or under-treatment of STIs. And what we wanted to do is to see if we could introduce a point of care testing, and I'll use this abbreviation quite a bit, STI point of care testing. We wanted to see the feasibility of introducing that for just chlamydia and gonorrhea, just two um, of the infections. It was a small pilot and that's the resources we had. And we wanted to be able to describe the kind of cascade, um, the way, same way we have an HIV cascade that comes from introducing that testing approach and to see whether this is something that health facilities, outpatient clinics, individuals going to outpatient clinics would find acceptable and perhaps even use a small pilot to identify correlates of prevalent CT and NG infection, infections so that we can inform future prioritization knowing that we live in countries where resources are very limited. Overall, we just wanted to assess, can it be done? How do we do it? And what are the practical aspects? I'll talk you through this method slide, um, just highlighting some of the key issues when you're dealing with something um, that needs to be practical. Our first step was to ensure that we engage the Ministry of Health um, in designing what the protocol would look like. And then we selected two clinics to pilot this at, and we had to engage those clinics in terms of identifying facility flow patterns that would allow this testing to be introduced. We engaged a manufacturer um, so that we could have test kits. And then we had to train and activate that's the, those sites that were um, uh, participating in the pilot. In the Ministry of Health has technically an STI assessment tool that captures STI history and, and um, uh, STI symptoms. So we use that tool. It's in, at, at the time consist, inconsistently used. And our target was that we'd be able to recruit 250 participants within around two months. We asked participants to collect samples and run them on existing laboratory platforms. And I can speak a little bit about that in the discussion. And then we offered a choice whether participants wanted to wait for the results or return by phone. And I'll explain why in a minute. And we conducted follow-up interviews to make um, to assess satisfaction with services, an exit poll with the health workers who participated in the analysis. Um, and for eligibility, we went to adults who were 18 to 45, who were sexually active, and had you um, had condomless sex or had multiple partners or a new partner or any symptoms. Because we wanted to assess feasibility and acceptability with self-collection of swabs. For the females, we randomized them to either you give us a, a urine sample or provide a vaginal swab. So I'll quickly move on already into the results in terms of the practicality and the uptake of this service. Um, first, in this um, graph, we just demonstrate that in the eight-week period we had stipulated, we were able to approach and recruit our 250 participants as targeted. So it wasn't something that was hard to do. It was easy uptake. Of the 250 people we offered the test, 
um, 248 accepted it, and that's an acceptance rate of 99%. And there was no difference between males and females. In fact, only two people did not uh, participate. And it was one male who said, I'm in a hurry, I don't have time to wait for this. And one female who took a vagina swab and didn't return to the um, didn't return the sample. So we didn't see any differences in acceptability by sex or by a sample collected, uh, especially for the women who are randomized to urine or vagina swab. So in terms of the practicality of it, um, as I alluded to earlier, we were aiming for a point of care test, but you will see here that um, we took around 22 minutes, um, just over 20 minutes to get everything ready for the sample to go to a lab. And so there was a little time of, for triage and moving um, the participant to where we could obtain verbal consent and then administering the tool and collecting the sample. In the lab, the platform we used with Cepheid, uh, the test runs for 90 minutes. And so on, on average, um, the test was taking around three hours for the test to run and samples to be provided. By and large, we were able to provide results within 24 hours. In fact, 90% um, of our participants received the results on the same day or the next day. Um, in terms of choice of return of results, um, mostly folks wanted to get results by phone um, because of that wait time. Nobody, uh, very few people wanted to wait for the results. And we noted that actually more males wanted results by phone. Um, slightly more women wanted to wait um, until they were able to get the results or to return in person to receive the results. So the 248 um, adults who participated in our study um, are shown, the characteristics are shown here. Um, this is a little bit dense, but I'll just highlight that the men were just slightly older. Average age was around 30. Um, you'll notice that a good number of them reported that they were having sex without using condoms. Um, around half, the, uh, just under half the men and over 60% of the women said they'd had genital symptoms recently. Um, and as well, You'll notice that um, we are dealing with a largely single population, so you expect maybe quite a bit of sexual activity. Um, we did have a significant number who were living with HIV um, in the region of around 39% uh, for males and 46% for females. And we did have a substantial population as well who reported that they had multiple partners. And this is gonna become important at the end when we think about prioritization. So what did our cascade look like? Um, as I mentioned, we offered to 250, we had a 99% acceptance and um, nearly everybody got results. We just had a few people who we could not reach to return results. So we identified 55 adults who had um, either CT or NG in our, our small pilot, and that's a prevalence of 22%. So of those, the majority were treated. Uh, we cancelled everyone we were able to give results to. Um, we cancelled them about partner notification. Um, about 85% of them told us that they notified their partners. The small interesting thing is um, this, this number of uh, participants listed 102 partners. Um, but when we sort of tried to prod who was notified, um, the number of partners notified was just under half. And I'll come to that in a second as well. So just a little bit of a deeper dive and no need to go into a lot of detail here because our sample size was small and this was a pilot study. But one of the things we noted is even with a small sample size, we had STIs detected in every age group. So our sample was 18 to 45 and we had STIs uh, from 18 to 45. So again, it may not be something we can really get to one age group. Um, it may be we need a bit of a broader think about it. Uh, we found that um, NG was more commonly detected among males, CT more commonly detected among females. And these are the summaries here of uh, the overall detection for either one infection. And that's the same, that's for males. And this is for females uh, with a urine sample and females with a vaginal swab. We did have one male and two females who had co-infection. And for a small sample, we didn't have any variation in detection by specimen type. 
We did not some missed opportunities though to mitigate the spread of STIs. Um, of the 55 adults that I said had um, CT or NG, 45% um, of them did not have current symptoms. So this means by syndromic diagnosis, these individuals would have gone home untreated. And if that number is not staggering enough, we tried to look at who would such people um, get in contact with. And this is a summary of our um, participants who, who, were, who had an STI and the number of partners that they listed. So whereas most participants said, I have one partner, so they, you know, 32 participants had 32 partners, you see here 10 participants that could potentially, with a CTNG STI, that could potentially reach nearly 50 participants. And so if we don't have a test and treat approach, these participants won't have symptoms, they'll go home with the infection and potentially continue to spread it. And then finally, on to prioritization, we had very few variables in our screening tool, um, but it did seem like if we had to prioritize, we could start with a younger age group, but we did see STIs in all the age groups because that's where um, the STIs were most commonly. This is the results of the logistic regression model. Um, we could also just really emphasize um, on people who just re report recent sexual activity and um, sex without using a condom, which is pretty much, um, you know, everyone in a sample, if you will. Um, what we did not see is um, an association with HIV status, at least in our sample, but we, you know, a significant number of, of participants were living with HIV, and we saw no correlation with symptoms. So again, um, that confidence interval touching one and emphasizing the point that relying on symptoms isn't for the best. Was there a satisfaction among healthcare workers and um, the, the clients who use this service? Um, this is a summary from a like a scale type of question that we administered where green is good, it's satisfied and very satisfied. Uh, yellow is neutral and um, the dark color is unsatisfied or the red, I hope it shows us red on your side. But by and large, you'll see that both clients and health workers were very satisfied with this service and where you have, um, and we're likely to ask for these services in future and, and offer the services in future. And the few reds you have are with health workers who were overworked and overloaded and saying, you know, if this has to come, we need a bit more help um, with our staffing. And this is particularly in the laboratory. And then we had feedback. Uh, we wanted to just see why would people take this up and what were they benefiting, um, both for clients um, or adults who are using the service and health workers. And largely, it's a need to know, um, just to assess my status. I'm curious, but also people who had symptoms. And one of the reasons we think we had a high uptake was our screening tool allowed us to check for um, exposure. So if there is any suspicion of exposure or risk, people may want to know, would want to know that they, they have an STI or not. Um, of course, friendly providers are important always, but maybe we need kids that don't even have to rely on providers, as well as um, healthcare workers pointed out that they didn't have to collect samples and most of the results came back the same day and this made them quite happy because they had something to treat. On the downside, um, the few um, clients and health workers who had complaints, it was the issue of time. Um, it did add some time and some people had to wait until the next day or two days later to get their results. And um, our pilot was limited to a short time, a small sample, um, a particular age group. And so for the healthcare workers, they, they really were concerned that this was too small and too quick and they needed more. So in summary, we demonstrated that introduction of um, our STI point of care testing was feasible and acceptable to our population. We had a high prevalence of uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea in our adults, but and we were able to use existing lab platforms 
for STI diagnosis. And we really want to propose that this can be used as a test and treat approach to STI management rather than flying blind based on symptoms and, and signs. However, a median turnaround time of three hours um, is not really point of care testing. It's more like near point of care. And I think we need tests that can turn around um, a diagnosis much faster. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I thank my team and acknowledge the, the support we received from Calderon for this work. Thank you. Wonderful, Harriet, um, that was also terrific. So um, we do have um, a few questions that have been um, uh, posted. So I think we can, we can start with those. We have um, a question from Julie Franks um, asking uh, Dr. Zucker, to talk about to talk more about the role of partner notification in in STI control, and could the availability of PEP increase the acceptability of partner notification? And I think Harriet, I will ask you to also expand a little bit on the role of these point of care type diagnostics, and perhaps in the future, self testing diagnostics in partner notification, but. Uh, Jason, please go ahead if you would start that first briefly, because we only have five <laughs> minutes. Uh, I, well, I always speak fast, but um, Julie, thank you for the question. I think obviously the role of partner notification is critical in STI control. If we could reach partners, we could treat more people and hopefully reverse what's been going on. I don't know if doxypep will increase the acceptability. I mean, the way it could do that is particularly if it reduces the stigma around STIs which is always the big problem around partner notification. You know, even in the case I used today, that person who's had numerous STIs in the past is just not comfortable notifying his partners. You know, many places have tried things like anonymous partner notification, other things like that with some mild success. But I think we have a long way to go both in reducing the stigma around STIs um, if we want to make partner notification a better method of control. Right. Harriet. Sure. Um... I think I would concur. Um, I, I, I think basing on signs and symptoms to go and have a conversation with your partner about what may or may not be present can be quite challenging. I do think just like with HIV, the introduction of a diagnostic test, any diagnostic test, whether it's for your blood sugar or something else makes a conversation with any individual you need support from or you need to communicate with much easier. So it certainly, I think, would would help with um, with communicating these things. Okay, great. Um, maybe just there are a couple of hopefully brief clarification questions. Um, uh, why was Igor vaccinated against HPV, and what were the strains um, in that that vaccine was effective against? I think that should be pretty quick. <laughs> So, you know, in the U.S., the CDC recommends routine HP vaccination for everybody under the age of 26 and for special populations aged 27 to 45, particularly people who may be exposed or vulnerable to HPV infection. Uh, he was vaccinated previously, so I don't know what he got, but currently we're giving the nine uh, strain uh, vaccine against HPV currently. Great. Um, then uh, we have a question from Andrea Howard, um, and I had a similar question thinking about antimicrobial resistance and surveillance for AMR and um, beyond what you <clears throat> showed from the clinical trials, are you aware of data from other kinds of surveillance studies that look at AMR, particularly for Neisseria gonorrhea? Yeah, so both the U.S. has two different mechanisms, and then the WHO has gonorrhea surveillance programs in place, and they do usually include either tetracycline or doxycycline resistance. They're not one-to-one, -one, but they're very, very close, um, so they do use that. You know, in terms of the advisability of using doxypep without AMR surveillance, I think if we're going to use it, it's okay. To be honest, I think most of us expect that gonorrhea will become resistant to doxycycline, and the long-term benefits of doxycycline are more for chlamydia syphilis than they're going to be for gonorrhea. The big question is, what is the impact of that resistance on gonorrhea, and are we going to see cross-resistance with other antibiotics? And I suspect that will get answered in the other countries where it's being monitored already. 
Um, but that's the real concern I think many of us have. It wouldn't stop me from using it, especially in places where testing is even harder, right? Like this is an option to reduce STIs. So if you have a population that's vulnerable, this could make a big difference. Right. Okay. Um, I don't know if, if anybody actually, let me see, has their hand up. I don't think so, but we could... If anybody wanted to pose the question, you should go ahead and, and raise your hand and, and we can take a look at that. Um, in the meantime, Harriet, um, I think more also as a clarification question, um, who would you say the results of your study generalized to? Were these individuals coming from general outpatient department settings? Were they coming in to STI clinics or tell us a little bit more so we can understand how to generalize these results. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I, I will answer that question and I see uh, another question around a clarification on how the vaginal swabs were collected. Um, so um, the, the, the results should be generalizable to your average individual attending an outpatient clinic in our setting and there's like 300 plus of those kinds of clinics, because these clinics offer um, integrated services, whether prevention or diagnostic or cure. And so we weren't selective on, um, you know, who this was offered to, as long as it was an adult. We didn't, at, because we were starting off, we didn't want to have to deal with, you know, issues of assent, consent below 18. Um, and also we're looking for some, some people who are really regularly sexually active. So we didn't have any discrimination in terms of are you ill or not? What have you come in for? Um, it's as long as you reported being sexually active and had a new partner or multiple partners, we approached you for recruitment. And pretty much everyone we approached said, yes, I want to I wanna have a test. And then in terms of the, the vaginal swabs, um, so we went for self-collected, so we would provide the, the swab to the participant and ask them to collect it themselves. And I think one of the things is traditionally we've been used to, you know, high vaginal swab and all that, and you know, the positions you have to assume. Um, but in consultation with our lab team, because the technique uses PCR, um, uh, you can get uh, fairly a, a good sample with a self-collected vaginal swab as well. So participants just went to the bathroom, same way you go for a urine sample and return the sample to us. And I'm gonna try to squeeze in <clears throat> two um, more questions. Um, for Jason from, from the Q&A box, there was um, uh, a question about pill burden and whether you know any of the studies, as far as you know, um, noted concerns about pill burden. And then while um, Jason is responding, Harriet, if you could think um, about the question about any of the um, participants in the study who tested negative for STIs, but they actually had symptoms. How were those individuals handled? How were they further investigated? Um, and can you make your screening tool available? But Jason, please go ahead on pill yeah. burden. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not super worried about pill burden because these tend to be young, healthy people without a lot of comorbidities. Even the people living with HIV were primarily on single tablet regimens. My bigger concern is actually confusion um, because you know, for people taking HIV prep, for example, they may be trying to take that on demand or 211, but then trying to remember when to time your doxypep. We've even had confusion among patients who were taking doxypep and then got chlamydia and then needed to take the 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days before going back on the doxypep. And so it can get very confusing very quickly. And so I am a little worried about confusion more than I am the pill burden itself. And, and Jessica, um, to your question, I didn't present those data, but we had 146 people who had some kind of symptom and were treated syndromically. And we had only 39 of those who had a CTNG. So technically 70% were treated without a CTNG. But the reason I didn't present that was, you know, there are other things that, you know, would lead to an STI, but um, it, it just goes to show that there's 
potentially over treatment because um uh you know nearly 70 percent not having symptoms but there are other things you have to allow for like you know bv and other um infections our diagnosis was only based on on ct and and ng so the short answer is the majority we had a lot more people with symptoms and we had fewer people with actual ct ng in our in our study And lastly, in terms of making the tool, the screening tool available? Yes. Um, so it's the Ministry of Health tool. Um, so I'm happy to put my email in the chat box um, and uh, and we see how to share it. But it's, it's, it's a tool that the ministry already has. Thank you. Okay. Well, I see we are at the top of the hour. So I think we'll close um, this um, session, which I thought was terrific. Uh, the webinar recording and the slides will all be posted um, on the ICAP website shown here. Um, and please put um, March 19th on your calendar for our next grand rounds um, title and topic to be announced. Um, so we'll leave you in suspense. Thank you for joining. Um, thank you, Jason and Harriet, for such wonderful and thought-provoking talks. Really great. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.